now, our friend, Glenn Kirscher, former 30-year federal prosecutor, served in the U.S. Army JAG Corps. You can check him out on MSNBC, the YouTube channel, Justice Matters with Glenn Kirshner, and touring with Stephanie Miller's Sexy Liberal Tour, where he was Saturday performing with, who was there, Ron Perlman, who's been on my show a few times. I like Ron. Of course, John Fugel sang, and Stephanie, and Frangela, and Hal yeah, Sparks. Yeah, and Hal Sparks, and uh, uh, Malcolm Nance, who oh, scared Malcolm. the crap out of all of us. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a great, great uh, show. It was a lot of fun to be on stage with all of them. They're funny, talented people. I like them all a great deal. I'm glad it went. So I saw pictures of it. I'm like, ah, I wish, because when they did it in New York a few years ago, then Steph had me as one of the people in the show. We like to have locals. And and so I did it. And it was a lot of fun doing that. So let's talk about Glenn, the big news. It first started last week. A couple of people pled guilty. Cindy Powell, the Kraken. Kraken is cracked. They cracked her. Kenneth Cheesebro. But let's start today. Jenna Ellis, who everyone remembers, uh, a younger person in the world of Trump, part of the elite, the elite strike force of election w- lawyers. She was no doubt, there's no disputing a Trump lawyer. She pled guilty to a charge today, a misdemeanor, and she had been charged with two felonies. Can you tell us like your reaction to Jenna Ellis? And we'll go through all three, just your reaction to each one so people get a sense. Uh, is it different or it's all a, a big picture in funneling towards Donald Trump and making his life more difficult? Yeah, so um, each one, I think, Dean, actually brings something a little bit different to the table as a cooperating witness. I, look, as a former career prosecutor, I was forever trying to convert defendants into cooperating witnesses that I could then use to build to the bigger fish, ultimately, you know, the biggest fish, the mob boss, the big orange blowfish in this case. And Jenna Ellis brings something, I think, important. The open question is, we don't know what she might have that would be directly incriminating of Donald Trump. We don't know, for example, how many meetings she might have been in with Trump himself where he is spouting out stuff that ultimately can be used to incriminate him. But here's what we do know. We know that she not only has tons of directly and sharply incriminating evidence against Rudy Giuliani, but we know that in today's plea, she threw Rudy under the bus, right? She said, yes, you know, the senior lawyers, I should have checked better when they were claiming things were facts that clearly were not facts. And here's what I found really interesting, Dean. I hope everybody is actually watching these proceedings because they're being televised and they're being live streamed. And if you didn't get a chance to watch today's guilty plea by Jenna Ellis, I would urge everybody, just go on YouTube because now it is there for all time. It took about 20, 22 minutes and watch it because there are some nuggets that aren't necessarily making it into the reporting I've been reading. One of the things Jenna Ellis said is not only did I aid and abet these false statements that Rudy Giuliani made to the Georgia state legislature, but we also did it the same thing. We provided the same false information to Arizona, folks in Arizona to folks in Michigan, to folks in Pennsylvania. Dean, it seems to me that there should be other state prosecutions coming just based on what Jenna Ellis said today under oath, that she and Rudy and others were peddling these same lies in other states, trying to undermine the election results in those states. So I have to believe prosecutors are you know, acting quickly to make sure that they're vindicating the violations of their state law. So that's something really important that I think Jenna Ellis brings to the table. Do you think from what you heard today that Jack Smith might call her in the January 6th case that's venued in Washington, D.C.? Absolutely. I don't see how the Jenna Ellis is, and we'll get to Chesbro and Powell in a minute. I don't see how their guilty plea in Georgia doesn't instantly turn them into a really important potential cooperating witness in the D.C., prosecution being handled by Jack Smith. Listen, if I were their lawyers, I would already have a deal with Jack Smith before I start pleading guilty to virtually the same conduct in another jurisdiction, in a state court. It's very interesting. And so let's talk about Cindy Powell, known as the Kraken. She was very involved with Team Trump. She was in the White House, the famous meeting, December 18, 2020, that went on for hours and hours. She was at press conferences. She's a former prosecutor. I mean, this is a person, like Jenna Ellis, I was looking at her background, really not much of a lawyer before this, to be blunt. Cindy Powell was actually a real lawyer. It was like a real prosecutor at one point. 
So what can you share about, she pled guilty to six misdemeanors. What can you share about this, about her? And what do you think she plays a role in? So of the three lawyers who have flipped, and there will be more lawyers flipping against Trump, I suspect soon, um, I think she's the one who is most likely to have directly incriminating evidence against Donald Trump. Look, she was in those crazy meetings in the Oval Office after yeah. Trump lost the election, but before January 6th. And th this is mind blowing. When they hatched part of this criminal scheme, the part that involved, because this was a multi pronged cr criminal scheme, but the part that involved getting the military to seize voting equipment from the battleground states, which violates multiple laws. One, it's called theft because the military doesn't get to go take state voting machines. It's a violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. That's, that's a mouthful, but that means the military is prohibited from engaging in civilian law enforcement matters. Um, Donald Trump made Sidney Powell or tried to make Sidney Powell special counsel for this part of the criminal conspiracy, this part of the corrupt scheme to try to overturn the election's results. So given that she was in the Oval Office for some of these meetings, given that he tried to make her special counsel for the conspiracy, she is going to have, I believe, some dramatically and directly incriminating information out of Trump's mouth himself. And that is some of the best incriminating evidence you can get. Think about Donald Trump. Today, he's sitting across the table. He's at the sitting at the defendant's table here in New York, and his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, who went to jail for his crimes, is testifying against him. You have Jenna Ellis pleading guilty, his former lawyer, and is going to testify in, called against him as Cindy Powell. And that brings us to Kenneth Cheesebro, who was not a, a per se a personal attorney of Donald Trump, but he was involved in drafting the whole fraudulent electric scheme and so many memos. When you go back and read the January 6th report, if you just search his name, his name comes up more almost than anyone. He really is seen as a true architect of so much, pressing and pressing and pressing, and even warning at certain points. Like, I'm not sure if this is completely above the board, but we're going to still do it. He pled guilty to a felony, opposed the other two for a misdemeanor. What does it say that he, a Harvard lawyer, Harvard-trained lawyer, pled guilty to a felony? You know, it says that I guess the allure of power and notoriety, or at least proximity to power, um, is too much for some people to resist, assuming Chesbro had some core of, you know, allegiance to the law and the Constitution somewhere along the way. He, he obviously lost it. But here is, I think, where he might be most useful as a cooperating witness, John Eastman. Hmm. John Eastman is the other guy who was involved in ginning up this fake elector scheme that both Eastman and Chesbro knew had absolutely no legal basis and no hope of succeeding in court. Chesbro even said, and eh, let's just do this for the political advantage. You don't bring lawsuits for political advantage, frivolous lawsuits. So it's really interesting when you pull back to 30,000 feet and look at what Fawny Willis has done, right? She brought Sidney Powell into the fold, who was in the Oval Office and can probably directly incriminate Trump, brought Jenna Ellis into the fold, who we believe can directly incriminate Rudy Giuliani, brought a Kenneth Chesbro into the fold, who it seems like can probably directly incriminate John Eastman. And Dean, the dominoes will continue to fall. Eastman is going to plead guilty. Just like, now mind you, the attorneys for these other three who just pleaded guilty, my client's innocent, not going to plead guilty. We're contesting the charges. Are bad. Where do we enter our guilty plea? Tomorrow? Okay, we're there. Now, right. that's, Dean, that's not a criticism uh, of, of defense attorneys. They zealously represent their clients at every interest until it becomes obvious that they're going to you know, plead guilty and strike a cooperation agreement. They go in and do that. But I would take everything that they say with a grain of salt when they're saying it, even if they seem to believe it, right? You know, when Chesbro's lawyer stepped to the cameras and said, uh, he's not going to incriminate Donald Trump. Well, that's called, you know, protecting your client's interests. Because can you imagine, Dean, if these lawyers stepped to the camera and said, oh, just wait, my client is going to crush Donald Trump. What would happen to that client, to that cooperator, to his family, to his friends, 
to his associates. You know what would happen. Mm -hmm. So everybody is playing their role, playing their part. But Dean, the dominoes are just going to keep falling. Like any good chain reaction, they're just going to keep falling. So as a former prosecutor, when you see this happening, is this imploding towards the center of the RICO? Like if you're doing the center of the RICO, like an eye of a storm, that's where Trump is and Giuliani. As these things start to collapse on it, is that what it's going to do? It's, it's going to, is the attention of Fannie Willis with these plea deals all to ultimately try to convict people up the chain, especially Donald Trump? Yep. Textbook. She's working her way up. Uh, of course, we still have Giuliani. We still have sure. Meadows. We still have Eastman. And then we still have a favorite of mine, corrupt DOJ lawyer, Jeffrey Clark, who oh. both corrupted and weaponized the Department of Justice as part of Donald Trump's criminal scheme. They're all going to get got, as we would say in Jersey. They are all going to get got. And the one who I don't I don't think will ever plead guilty is Donald Trump, because I think a, a malignant narcissist doesn't have it in him to walk into court and publicly admit his own wrongdoing, that he was wrong. Um, and that's just fine, because I want to see Donald Trump go to trial in Georgia. I want to see Donald Trump go to trial in D.C., you know, Florida. Um not all that confident about because of, of Judge Luce Cannon. But I want to see the evidence against Donald Trump, and I want a jury of his peers to say guilty, and I want to see him sentenced to prison because that is the only thing, Dean, that will deter tomorrow's aspiring dictator from doing it all over again. I agree. I'm telling you with our friend Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, in the case of Kenneth Cheesebro, who was admitted in New York in Massachusetts, I was looking up where he was admitted, and in New York, when you plead guilty to a felony, any felony, you're automatically disbarred. We're the only state, I'm admitted here in New York, we're the only state that still has it. I looked it up, it's still in effect. So what does that say about the level of the evidence that Fannie Willis's team had to present to Kenneth Cheeseboro's lawyers? Because it's not just pleading guilty and not and getting probation. He's disbarred in New York, and he'll likely be disbarred in other states because of it's a felony. Yeah, this is such a vindication of Fawny Willis's tactical choices and her decision to go big or go home. She went big, she went broad, she went sweeping with a 19 co-defendant RICO prosecution. And it is now, she's now proving that that was the right approach in Georgia. She wanted to bring a, a prosecution that was a comprehensive vehicle that would hold everyone accountable for their crimes in Georgia. Whereas Jack Smith, took the exact opposite approach in D.C., single defendant, Donald Trump. Now, mind you, those six um, unindicted co-conspirators that are in Jack Smith's indictment in D.C., mm -hmm. they're not named, but they're identified in substance. Sure. That indictment is coming. Those six will oh, either so? plead guilty and cooperate, or they will be indicted, they will be taken to trial, and they will be convicted. And here's why, Dean. There is no prosecutor on this planet who would put in a public document, like an indictment of a former president of the United States, these were the six people who, together with Donald Trump, in a conspiracy, tried to end our democracy. But I'm not going to charge them. I'm not going to hold them accountable. This is all strategy. This is tactics. And those people will also get got. But D.A. Willis decided to do it all at once up front. Jack Smith has taken a different approach. And frankly, I think they're both right. So in the case with Jack Smith, the January 6th case, they can try Trump, get a conviction, and then indict the other people that are in that? There's Absolutely. No mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, jeopardy doesn't attach until you are charged in a case and the jury is sworn. When a jury against you is sworn, that's the minute that jeopardy attaches. So yeah, he can do this as a series of, of trials. So it's funny, I, I really didn't do any criminal law in Jersey, except for, you know, misdemeanor and below, like, not, you know, municipal court stuff. But for civil law, we have this thing called the entire controversy doctrine, where if you have a claim, everything's got to be to get litigated together. Obviously, it doesn't apply in criminal settings. But it's interesting to hear that because all I'm like, how could you do that? But of course, I'm thinking about civil law in New Jersey, not criminal law at the felony level where Glenn Kirscher is a master of that. So Glenn, you know, you were very happy like I was when Judge Chutkin in the D.C. case, uh, imposed a narrow gag order on Trump. It's still a gag order. Then Friday, the Friday this past, she put a stay on it to allow Trump's team and DOJ to file briefs on whether it should be held a, a stay for the entire appeal. What's your reaction? What's going on? So we understand what's happening here. 
Yeah, I, I don't understand because behind the scenes, there's a lot going on that we're just not privy to. Okay. Um, he, but here is my take on it, if I can read between the lines. First of all, Judge Chutkin has been making all of the right moves, the strong moves. And so I think what, what she may have done is she heard from the parties, right? Both parties filed um, motions and replies. And, and I sat through a two, that two-hour hearing where she heard mm -hmm. arguments from both sides and she um, said, I'm imposing a gag order and my written gag order will be forthcoming. She previewed it orally in court at the end of the two-hour hearing. And then she issued a gag order that is pretty novel, right? She tried to be narrow. She tried to be tailored, but it, it's pretty novel. So, for example, when she said, you can't criticize court staff, I don't think she included herself as court staff, but she said, and then she said, you can't criticize Jack Smith or his staff. So, this is, I mean, the way all of that plays out, I think, is an open question. So it feels to me, Dean, like once she issued that unusual order, she wanted to give the party some time to provide some more briefing on it, because now it's concrete. Now they know what they're contending with, and they can make their best argument if they want to try to raise it with the, in the, with the appellate court in D.C., let them raise it. But I don't think it's a sign of weakness. I wasn't happy to see her pause it because, of course, Donald Trump went out and started calling, you know, Jack Smith a deranged lunatic again. And that is one of the things that would have been prevented by the gag order. So I wasn't thrilled to see her pause it, but I can understand why she did. So you were at the oral argument and Judge Chutkin said in that, and I'll read the quote, this trial will not yield to the election cycle and we will not revisit the trial date. She said that, that March 4th trial date. Do you get a sense this is really, look, there's no trial date set in stone. We know that that's life. But is this close? To, like at a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cement that's sort of drying right now around March 4th? Yeah. First of all, I got, I got some justice goosebumps when she said that. Because uh. she said that, Dean, in response to Donald Trump's lawyer saying, and I can almost quote him verbatim, um, you know, he was contending that there is no gag order that can survive constitutional scrutiny, none. He said, the only solution to this problem, Judge, is to move this trial until after the 2024 presidential election. And Judge Chutkin got animated. And she said, this trial will not yield to the election cycle. We will not revisit this trial date. I'm going to take her at her word. I used to try murder cases against her when she was a public defender and I was a homicide prosecutor in D.C. I have great, enormous respect for her, both her integrity and her ethics and her abilities as a defense attorney. And the same is true of her when I've seen her presiding over cases in federal court in D.C. I wouldn't test her. Now, you know, Dean, the defense is going to file a hundred motions to continue between now and then. I predict they will all be denied and we will be in that courtroom for jury selection beginning March, March 4th. Will you be there? Yes. Oh, this is exciting. This is, it's exciting for so many reasons. The, we're going to see what happens. Now, let, let's shift gears. I'm chatting with our friend Glenn Kirshner. New York AG fraud case is going on right now. And Michael Cohen testified today. We know that he's testifying. He's saying he committed his crimes for Donald Trump and all of that. And, but on Friday, I think it was Friday, the, the judge imposed a $5,000 penalty on Donald Trump for violating that gag order because he left up on his website the smear of the judge's law clerk. And he had some really good language here. The judge said that, I was looking at the order, the judge warned that future violations will sub subject Trump to, quote, far more severe sanctions, including possibly imprisoning him. Uh, is Donald Trump finally getting to feel slightly more like an what a normal person and, and the end of special treatment for this guy feels like? Not yet, because he's still out there footloose and fancy free after endangering the community, endangering our democracy. So and one one other quote I want to attribute to Judge Chutkin, which was both true and incredibly disheartening when I heard her say that when I was in court, she said, listen, if there was any other defendant on pretrial release who said the prosecutor handling his case is a deranged thug, that person would be in pretrial detention. Their, re their release would be revoked. That's true, but it's really disheartening because it highlights 
the you know unequal application of the laws and that really is the shame of this whole sad episode but is he feeling a little bit more of the heat i have to believe he's feeling a little bit more of it every day but you know what if it were you and i we'd be burned to a crisp and his his little hands are just warming up right now and, and glenn when you know i read what the judge had written and, and i read some of the cases in other jurisdictions in the past and you heard the whole orga- oral argument is there objectively speaking a little bit more leeway given to people who really are elected officials or mainstream plausible candidates running for office and they cited the ford case with harold ford senior and a a couple from louisiana because there's a lot of corruption in louisiana and i I should talk about jersey but in any event there's so there's some corruption cases there objectively speaking though is there a teeny bit more leeway afforded to people like this yeah well dean you know you and i are from jersey and we're all you know pure as the driven snow everybody knows that um (laughs) But I think the answer is yes, and here's why. Part of it doesn't sit well with me, but part of it is understandable because you don't want to interfere with free and fair elections. You don't want to interfere with candidacies for elected office. And, you know, there is always the risk of abuse by folks in the criminal justice system. We saw it with Bill Barr misusing the criminal process to political advantage. That is not going on here. Donald Trump is endlessly calling the prosecutions, right? The people who are trying to hold him accountable for his crimes. They say he's engaged in election, they're engaged in election interference. No, they're just enforcing the law and trying to hold you accountable, but there is a risk. So I do think when you're a defendant and you're also a candidate for office, the system gets a little bit, um, uh, a little bit timid, right? They, 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 they want to make sure that if they're going to impose restrictions on somebody, that it is based 100% on the law and the facts and 0% on politics. The problem is there will always be an allegation by the opponent that this is being done for political reasons. And sometimes for fear of that criticism right. being lodged, the system backs up and does nothing at all, a la Donald Trump. And very last thing here, the last minute or two we have, you know, uh, everything we talk about is the criminal cases, I understand. But Colorado, this Monday, the Section 314th Amendment case is scheduled to go to trial. And, of course, it could get moved, but it looks like it's on a train starting for Monday because the judge has been dismissing Trump's motions to dismiss. Could this potentially be the case it gets to the Supreme Court, depending on the ruling? It- it absolutely could be. And I think multiple cases will be decided in multiple states on the issue of whether Donald Trump is disqualified from having his name on a presidential ballot for having engaged in, assisted, and given aid and comfort to the insurrection, all of which he did. The evidence is there. I would contend it's indisputable. So I think all of this stuff will get decided by state courts. It will bubble up to the Supreme Court. And here, here is, I, I think, the silver lining behind the big dark cloud that is Donald Trump. I don't think the Supreme Court will do anything to enable an aspiring dictator to get back into the Oval Office because then they're running the risk of being marginalized themselves because a dictator has no use for a Supreme Court, only an inferior court. So I don't trust the Supreme Court or a block of the justices to do the right thing, but I do believe they will act based on self-motivation, the, the yep. Alitos and the uh, and the Thomases. And they will, I, I think they're going to hold strong on the, the 14.3 front. I really do. I hope so. Well, Glenn, thanks so much for being on. Again, on YouTube, check out Justice Mathers, Glenn Kirshner. Check out, you're still doing a podcast? I can't keep up. You got a lot of stuff. I still do the audio podcast. Yep, yep. Same thing that's available everywhere. Glenn, thanks for taking time off your comedy career to join us here to go through. And good luck back on the road. <laughs> you and Mazda Brani, the one-two comedy punch. Your wife will I'll, love I'll be I'll be at the Chuckles Barn in, uh, in uh, no, I'm not going to be at the Chuckles Barn. The Chuckle Hut. It, Glenn Kirsch, you're catching with <laughs> Mazda Brani and Otis. Thanks, Glenn. Have a great night. Take care. Thanks, Dean.